Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the RightScale and Google Social Gaming webinar. I uh, hope everyone's having a, a good Tuesday. Uh, we're going to start off with a couple of polls, and then we're going to get, get rolling with the webinar in just a few minutes. So the, uh, the first one should be popping up on your screen in just a moment here. So the first one is, uh, where are you in the cloud adoption process? Uh, take a minute, fill this out. Just getting started, a little bit of usage. Uh, looks like looks like for the most part people are pretty pretty new to the cloud process. That's we're going to be covering a lot of the basics today. Okay, now the results are up. What is, uh, what is your role in the organization? Are you a team lead or a business manager, a systems architect, a system administrator, a developer, an IT manager? Great. So it looks like we have a lot of uh, a lot of team leaders. We'll uh, we'll make sure to focus on some of the more management aspects that that RightScale and Google have to offer. Yep. This is Brandon. Uh, looks like we have a few good architects, so we should have some good pieces to that a little bit later as well. Great. And what is your experience thus far with the Google Cloud Platform? Great. It looks like we've got a pretty pretty good mix going here. Okay. So I think the net of this is uh, this is Brandon Young from Google. It appears that uh, our AdWords spy is not doing as well as we should. We need to make people more familiar with Google Cloud Platform. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's uh, let's get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming again. Uh, that was Brandon who, uh, who was just speaking up there. So let's let's go quick introductions here. My name is Hunter Williams. Uh, I I oversee right scale and Google partnership from both a uh, sales and go to market perspective as well as a, a technology perspective. Uh, Brandon, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. And uh, voice you have here is Brandon Young from Google. Uh, I lead up our our technical uh, aspects for our partnerships uh, across the cloud platform. Uh, as well as do quite a bit of the go-to-market and sales aspect. Thanks. So also on Q&A, we have our own Spencer Adams. Uh, so please uh, please use the questions window at any time to ask questions. Um, we will address a number of those towards the end of the webinar. Uh, and and as you come up with things, please uh, please note the slide number, and we'll be happy to, uh, to address those at the end. First off, a quick history of RightScale. Uh, we are the, the leading cloud management platform out there. We've been uh, interfacing with cloud platforms since the very very early days of, of cloud platforms. Um, we have a worldwide user base, uh, north of 5.5 million servers launched through the platform to date. Uh, we power most of the largest cloud productions in the world. So we have you know, Zynga, you see there, uh, Disney, Crowdstar, American Girl, Mattel, uh, EA and a variety of other uh, of other gaming customers. Brandon, would you like to introduce the, the Google Cloud Platform? Absolutely. Uh, so, building kind of from the bottom up, uh, probably the easiest thing of if you look here at the bottom, uh, the little in, uh, interlocking diamonds, as it were, in the bottom represent uh, Google Compute Engine. And so, most of what we're going to be talking today about is uh, Compute Engine. Uh, this is uh, a virtual machines, virtual Linux machines, uh, designed as infrastructure as a service. Uh, bring what you guys want to do and build on top of it. And we'll go through. Uh, you'll see some of Wrightskill's great architectures that they built on top of it. Um, so that's kind of the, the focus piece. Uh, the other ones that we'll be referencing today that are important uh, is Google Cloud Storage. Uh, Cloud Storage can uh, it takes on a couple different aspects. It can be as simple as blob store where you want to store a large amount of data. 
for our use cases, though, it's probably more cases going to be either Cloud SQL. So there's a managed SQL, uh, fully redundant cross region kind of managed SQL solution. Or, of course, no SQL, which is uh, sort of our bread and butter. This is where Google uh, sort of jumped into the big uh, data space. Um, the next piece over here, when we look at Google BigQuery, uh, probably the easiest for you on the phone that are familiar with Hadoop. Uh, this is going to be the next innovation on top of Hadoop, and I'll actually uh, dig into this a bit later. But uh, the important piece for you to, kind of, to, to think about BigQuery as far as a service or a tool that you guys can leverage as gamers, uh, you build a great application or a great game, you launch it, and it takes off like gangbusters, but you don't know why. Uh, and so you've got a bunch of log data coming back in, and that becomes the point at which BigQuery is a phenomenal uh, place for you guys to figure out where your customers are clicking, what are they using, and what's going to drive the next level of adoption for you. So I think the, the last piece we look at here is Google APIs, and these are premium APIs that you can leverage for anything from prediction to geolocation, uh, machine learning, translation, uh, et cetera. And there's more of those than we can probably begin to touch on, but they're very useful on things like taking a game global, right? So you want to put that into different languages. There you go. You've now got a great tool uh, to launch just that. So that's kind of the foundational pieces that you're going to see referenced. Uh, I may jump in as, as Hunter is going through it, but those should give you a good sense as to the piece, uh, pieces that we're going to be talking about today. Thanks, Brandon. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, about why RightScale and Google together. Uh, we, we've had a, a number of customers go through the process already, and we're, we're starting to see a lot of traction. Um, and, and we're also starting to see some of the preliminary results of, of our integration and, and what we think is a, a really great partnership come back in, in the form of happy customers. Um, so, so the first and foremost uh, interesting thing that we've seen is the extraordinarily consistent results. Um, so Brandon's going to talk a bit about the architecture in, in a little while, but we see extraordinarily consistent performance across the different uh, offerings that Google has, uh, whether that's response times for instances, whether that's response times between different instances in different regions, uh, or just data transfer rate or read and writes on a database. We, we find those to be um, extraordinarily consistent, um, none are really slow, none are e extraordinarily fa faster than others. Um, and, and then if you couple that with the right-scale provisioning system server templates, which takes a, a raw Linux VM that's in Google Compute, uh, you end up with, with a very predictable system. So anytime you spin up a, a scalable database environment or a, uh, a widely scaled game on a global basis, um, you're getting the same thing every time, and it makes it makes a big difference in the performance of your game and really in the end user experience. Next is that RightScale really provides a single pane of glass for all your cloud-related activities at Google. So everything from starting with forecasting costs and trying to understand what what your game is going to run you, you know, one year, two years, three years down the road as you grow and as you scale. Um, all, all the way through to being able to apply the automation to the actual infrastructure so that you can scale and can see uh, your system grow and your user base grow as well. We're allowing, uh, what Google is allowing you to do with, with Google Compute, and Brandon, again, is going to talk about this a bit, is that you know, you're able to leverage the operational excellence that Google is so well known for. Uh, they are uh, masters of their craft when it comes to running data centers around the world. Um, setting up networks, all of that is stuff that Google has done as their core bread and butter for a long time. Uh, and, and being able to take uh, take advantage of the Red Scale Cloud Management Platform, which which is you know most commonly chosen by gaming companies around the world, um, it, it really allows you to have a, a best in breed infrastructure environment. And then last, but cer certainly not least, is being able to apply automation across your whole system. So scalability is certainly one of the most attractive things that brings people to the cloud. Um, however, we find that automation can, can range into a, a whole variety of different, uh, different manifestations, um, from self-service provisioning, where you can uh, give developers a self-service UI. They can go in and uh, spin up a production environment and load in a game from a, a subversion or a Git repository or even just directly out of a tarball. 
um, through auto scaling certainly, and then also to operational automations, so dealing with clearing a cache, dealing with uh, Apache going down, dealing with data backups, all of that can be automated through the platform. Uh, and then being able to really uh, deal with the, the end of life transition of your game. So as you start to roll forward from one game to the next, you want to be able to leverage some of the things that you've learned and some of the, the technologies that you've developed in, uh, in previous games. So Red Skull allows you to, uh, to very easily take advantage of that. So how does, this, how does this work? We've heard over and over again from gaming companies that the most important thing in the early stage of their game is time to market and reducing time to market. Um, it, it is uh, usually first and foremost above cost even. So RightScale has developed a, an onboarding service that we call premium onboarding. The way, excuse me, the way that it works is that we first off provide the customer with documentation and some, some self-service assistance that they can get up to speed and do some e-learning on the RightScale platform. Then for the first game, we work with them in, in a very iterative fashion to understand their requirements and help them build a work plan to build their game and build their infrastructure out in the RightScale system on Google Cloud Platform. Um, that can be everything from understanding how to tweak PHP or their, or their MySQL templates um, through to understanding where bottlenecks appear through load testing. So we work with the customer as they build their environment. It's, a, again, a very iterative process. We hold weekly calls to, to make sure that everything is on track and everything is going smoothly. And then at the end, we provide some, some triage and some uh, launch day assistance. So if, you know, something goes wrong or your game begin, begins to scale in an erratic fashion, uh, you're going to have a right scaler there to help you and make sure that everything gets taken care of, that you understand uh, the best practices and can make sure that everything is architect architected correctly. Next is forecasting costs. It also happens on the front end of, uh, of your game development. So it's, it's important to understand, and it's, you know, in the cloud world, it is honestly fairly difficult to be able to budget against a variable cost. You don't necessarily know how fast your game might grow. You don't necessarily know how many connections per server you're going to see based on how your game performs. Um, with, our, with a tool that we, uh, through an acquisition, RightScale bought a company that became Plan for Cloud. And if you, you can check it out, free service, planforcloud.com. And what it'll allow you to do is go in and build your environment from a uh, cost perspective. You can see, I need this many PHP servers, I need this many Apache web servers, I need this many database servers. Uh, you can give it different scaling characteristics, you can give them different instance sizes, uh, you can give it different net amounts. Uh, and, and then you're going to be able to look at and forecast, you know, one year, two years, three years down the road based on different growth patterns, different scale patterns, uh, maybe even different, uh, different game launches. You're going to be able to go and see, all right, you know, this is going to be my total, uh, you know, annualized cost for this game. You can go back and more accurately budget. I mentioned it earlier, but the Red Scale provisioning system is based on a technology that we call server templates. Um, the way that a server template works is that we take a base image, this thing at Google Compute, um, it's, you know, a, a, call it a CentOS 6.2 image, and what it is is it's just a light load of the operating system with the Red Scale agent baked into it. Um, that server then launches the, any type of a server template, but some examples would be a MySQL template, or a PHP server template, or a memcache server template. So when that template gets launched, the image that's behind it is, is kicked off in Google Compute, and we, you know, by the way, one of the many benefits of, of using Google Compute is that we see unbelievably fast boot times on those. So the image becomes an instance per, very, very quickly, under a minute. Um, it then connects back to the right scale core system and downloads all of the scripts or chef recipes or puppet scripts um, or, or shell scripts, what, whatever it is that you'd like to use as a configuration technology, it downloads that information in real time and then sets the server up. Uh, the, the big benefit to that is that, one, you get the same environment every time because you're loading the same packages, the same RPMs, all of the same dependencies are there. Uh, but you're also loading the most current information about your environment. 
So take a quick example here. If you're running, let's say, 100 servers for a gaming environment, you've got maybe a million users that play your game on a daily basis. Um, you want to launch 10 more application servers. Those servers are going to download the IP addresses for all the load balancers that they're going to need to connect to and register with, um, whether they, you know, whether they change daily or whether they're scaling as well. It's going to give them the most current list, and it's going to update it dynamically throughout the life cycle of that instance. <clears throat> it's also going to connect it with the databases that are relevant for it. So we see in the social gaming space a lot of database sharding. So people taking a, a database and splitting it, you know, a, a through M and N through Z, um, or you know, seeing shards as high as 40 or 50 different shards for a single game. Um, however, it's important that each application server be, you know, updated in the security group, be able to have access to that database, uh, be checked in with a load balancer, sending monitoring data back. Uh, all, all of that needs to happen automatically. And if you're using server templates, they're simply downloading all of that information as environment variables that are relevant for that server to know. Um, these, these templates work across all the different regions that Google has available. Um, which, which is at this point a, a couple in the EU and a few here in the U.S. as well. Um, we, we expect many of those to grow as well. Uh, and and they're, they're really abstracted from the actual structure. So if you were to uh, need to migrate from, let's say, the, the eastern region of Google to the central region, it's as simple as launching the same server template and just changing the location that you launch it in. Uh, it, it certainly helps that, and Brandon will talk about this, the Google network is as advanced as it is, that that would all happen over a private network and be completely encrypted. Um, but it's, uh, it's just a, another side benefit of using the right scale in Google uh, offering. So the, the, before we jump into the Google platform, I wanted to close with right scale automation. Uh, this is really, really key for gaming companies, and we've seen this with, with a lot of our bigger companies like Zynga and EA, um, where they want to apply a lot of automation so that they can maintain a smaller team with a larger infrastructure footprint. Uh, every server that gets launched through the right scale system automatically streams back monitoring data, which then gets turned into two different things. Um, one is monitoring graphs so that you can go in and visualize the data and see what's going on. You can create stack graphs to be able to see if you were having any particular uh, problems or, or growth patterns. You can create heat maps for extremely large infrastructure sets. So if you need to see you know, certain times a day or times a week, you have big spikes in traffic. We've built some heat mapping technology for that. Uh, and the other place the monitoring data goes is into our automation engine. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty standard uh, alert and escalation system where data comes in and an if-then statement happens on it. So take an example here. Um, you know, for scalability, if let's say CPU exceeds 80% for more than two minutes across a majority of the servers, then launch an, an additional five servers. And RightScale can automatically do that in the background for you, and it maintains simply what you need to, to keep up with demand. Um, we can sc scale up and down by different amounts, and so you can scale up a little bit more than you need then back down to optimize that cost. Um, scalability, like I mentioned, is just one of the types of automation that we see. Um, some of the other areas are you know, Apache not running, or instance not responding, or uh, MySQL not replicating. All of those can also be driven into the automation system and have Apache restarted or have that instance relaunched. Uh, all of that stuff is done through the automation system and can be automated to, to really try to minimize overhead um, and, and increase your margins ultimately. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon to go through the, the Google Cloud platform. Uh, please, uh, please put any questions in the questions area if there was anything on right scale at this point. And Brandon, take it away. Much appreciated, Hunter. So, one thing I think that maybe it helps maybe lay lay down a little history as far as uh, why Google got in. Um, as a gaming company, you're going to leverage right scale on a day to day basis. That's going to be the pane of glass if you want to leverage it. So you're not going to see necessarily uh, a whole lot of Google uh, on a day to day. It's, it's going to be right scale that you'll see. So I think it's important just to say why we're partnering with RightScale, and then also give you kind of a sense as to how we jumped into uh, this space. So um, from a background standpoint, Google traditionally built all of our 
services, whether it was search or it was Gmail or it was ads or it was YouTube. And we built those all and we had made a strategic decision that we were going to keep uh, all of the capabilities, scale, et cetera, internal. What's changed a little bit over the last uh, nine months is we've now decided that we're going to go ahead and externalize that. And while that's the first time that most of the rest of the world is going to be able to leverage the scale and capabilities of Google, um, we do use the same kind of infrastructure everyone else does from the standpoint of we still use memory, we still use disk, we still use you know processors. Um, our network's drastically different, and that will be something as a gaming company that will mean a ton, and we'll kind of talk some of the specific advantages there. Um, but while we're newer stepping into this space, I think it's pretty important to take a step back and give you an idea of what we've actually been doing over the last uh, 10, 15 years in uh, the space as far as where you guys see. And that's why I look at here when we say Google Innovation. Uh, on the right-hand side uh, is actually what those are is white papers that Google's released along with the years that we went ahead and released them. So if you kind of go in, we go lower left, upper right, which is totally not intuitive, but uh, the arrow points up to the right, so I have to follow the arrow, I guess. Um, just kidding. Uh, when you look at GFS and you look at MapReduce, these are the foundational uh, technologies along with it with Bigtable to what the rest of the world now calls my S or no SQL, excuse me, no SQL. Um, as you kind of continue to move up, you look at Preggles, you look at Plume Java, and then you look at Dremel, Spanner, and Colossus. These are, and Dremel will talk about the commercial name for Dremel, that white paper, is now uh, BigQuery. The reason I bring this up is that Google, from what you have seen up till now, uh, has all been behind a cloak and you haven't been able to leverage it. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have a good idea of where Google's been for years. And just taking a step back, and when we look at the foundational pieces with you know, Bigtable, MapReduce, GFS, they create a NoSQL, and then the step beyond that, of course, is Hadoop. Uh, the world of Hadoop is really coming in to its own. We've seen that through MongoDB. We've seen that in um, Hortonworks. We've seen that in MapR. Those are really taking off. But it's important to note that this technology was technology that Google ran ourselves now 10 years ago. So it's really great for um, you guys to be able to leverage this through right scale. Uh, it's been abstracted and we try and simplify this so you guys can consume it easily. Uh, but that's really kind of the background behind where we're going. Um, some important pieces though that we've delivered in order to deliver these capabilities at the scale, some really phenomenal consistency. Uh, the feedback that we're getting initially is some really important things. One, the boot and speed time of instances is um, is far and above what most people are seeing on any other public clouds. The consistency is really important. Uh, this is really critical in doing that scaling. Uh, that right scale does a great job on scaling, um, but they can do a better job if they actually know what they need to scale. So if it's a linear scale in model where they're sure that each instance that they ramp up is going to give you a certain number of users, so each instance gives you, say, a thousand more users, that's much easier and more cost effective and efficient, and you can kind of go through the list than if one instance that you ramp up may give, be able to serve additional thousand gaming clients and the next one does 250. So uh, there's a lot of pieces there that's pretty important. Uh, HANA was kind enough to kind of give you guys a good idea of the global footprint we sit under. Uh, so the global footprint, will, I'll show a little bit here later in some network. Uh, but covers and on this network and everything, of course, is what we run all of our own infrastructure on. So um, the note on this, and maybe this wasn't perfectly clear, we didn't create a special infrastructure aside from Google for you guys to work on. What we've done is taken Google's infrastructure that runs search, and we've externalized it to the world. Um, that's important because we're not just adding additional VMs and a little hardware and some more network and then renting out a piece of it, right? This isn't about just virtualizing up hardware. This is about taking advantage of all the stuff that Google's been doing for years. So with that, um, it's probably interesting to see a metric that gives you guys a sense as to um, what performances look like, because that would be my next question. And I think on the next slide, uh, as Hunter flips there, um, we have a uh, company called MapR. Again, this is going back to a Hadoop workload. It's important and probably a good comparison for you guys to think about because it's a very high network, uh, very high network requirements. 
as well as very high performance and consistency from speed. Um, so a little bit of a background, this actual uh, benchmark that was uh, beat by MAPR is what's called the Chosort record. How fast that you can process a terabyte of data. And one of the things that's most important in executing a really fast time on this isn't necessarily the front end how fast you can ramp up the servers, it's how consistently they return the data because it's actually your long tail that matters. Uh, this is also for you guys at gaming, this will be your uh, and you, these will be your users that have a bad experience. So you want to avoid as many of those as possible. So the consistency has led to this. It's speed, but it's also consistency. Uh, the previous record was bespoke hardware, uh, delivered in a matter of just under a year to actually build it, roll it out, in the orders of millions of dollars to tens of millions of dollars to do this. Um, they did it on a, this was delivered with a fourth, excuse me, a third of the number of cores, so you'll see instead of 12,000, 4,000 cores. And the number of disks is one-sixth. One note so you guys understand on this, typically this has been something that bespoke hardware built out, huge network capabilities, millions of dollars. MapR did this, and Google didn't do anything whatsoever to our infrastructure. We simply gave them their infrastructure, they signed on, and MapR went off and created it. So it's important to give you a good sense, and obviously this means that your performance for your gaming should really sing uh, with uh, Compute Engine. The next part to that though, and this is important since a lot of you, if you're launching a game, you wanna look at your network. So Hunter, if you look at the next slide, this isn't just about um, the speed uh, inside of a data center, but it's the speed and capability across the entire global uh, footprint. Uh, Google was in the right place at the right time and a lot of reasons, but we own an enormous amount of uh, dark fiber. It's all of our fiber that connects all these points all over the world. Um, what that means, in addition to, you'll see the link on the bottom here that tells you if you want to look at all the um, other peering networks we have, the net of it is that when your customer has a request to Google, they will probably be one or two hops away from hitting directly to the server because they get right on our backbone, on our dark fiber, anywhere they are in the world, and they're delivered right to wherever that compute is going on faster than, uh, faster than anyone else in the world. And this is unique and will result in a much better end user experience for you guys. Um, I think the other couple things to this is that our network also, if you want to leverage it, has the ability to um, have CDN-like kind of capabilities, meaning some edge caching capabilities to get data out to the very edge of uh, the uh, network for your clients that are, you know, again, delivering these in a worldwide kind of game. Uh, and the last one that's probably um, going to be useful in here to understand is data transfer costs. So for those of you that are newer, uh, you might, or newer to, say, uh, the cloud space, you might not be aware, but one of the big costs tends to be the ingress, egress costs, and especially if you're going between, say, data centers with a lot of providers, or if you're delivering across uh, multiple providers. While you're on Google's network, there is no cost coming in for that, and so that's a, a good one uh, to go through. Brent, Brandon, could, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on, you know, data security? Is, is this data that's being transferred encrypted or anything like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, that's obviously critical. Uh, all of the data is encrypted in transit. It's encrypted at rest. So from a security standpoint, um, Google's infrastructure was, has, um, well, the, the actual security is obviously very good, but there's also a lot of third-party uh, verification for that. So uh, SAS 70, SSA 16, a lot of those other pieces, if those are some, some if those are important to you guys, by all means, uh, let us know when we have very detailed security papers. But uh, the in-transit encryption, at-rest encryption for all your data um, is an important piece to, to also highlight. That's great. Uh, and the last one is, let's say we expect you guys are going to blow it up. This is a phenomenal game. You have just kicked it right through the roof. Now, the next question is going to be, I have great data. What in the world was it? that made this game successful. And I think that's where, if we look at the next slide, we've got something that is phenomenally unique and really easy to use. So you'll see on here, um, and I'll kind of explain it left to right, 
um, let me be a few too many arrows here, but uh, this is BigQuery. And what BigQuery does is taking unlimited storage, in this case I would expect most of the time this is going to be your logs, um, and then you can do interactive analysis against multi-terabyte data sets. Um, so you can pull this data in from, like I said, here is representing, it could be anything from your AdWords or your, your clickstream data or wherever you want, uh, pulling it in, storing Google Cloud Storage, and then you can interactively, if you want to mash it up against other data, you can do that. And you run a query against it, and all you need to know is basic SQL. Um, for those of you that haven't had to create a Hadoop instance and then manage it, and then, by the way, write our code against it, and whether you want to do that in Hive or you want to do it in Pig, uh, it's, not, it's not an easy process. Uh, and also, by the way, it tends to be done in a batch, uh, from a batch lifecycle standpoint, meaning it may take you, if you have a large amount of data, it could take you hours or perhaps um, even days, depending on the size that you're working against, to get that answer back. This is something that we've seen a huge number of gaming clients really, um, and our mobile clients really leverage in some really phenomenal ways to better understand their clients, iterate and build uh, the next best game. So how do you want to change that game? You need to manage it and scale it. Right Skills got phenomenal capabilities to do that. Um, this is going to tell you what you need to write in code for the next release. So I think with that, I'm going to hand it back to Hunter. He's going to do a little bit of demo, and then we'll get to questions here in a little bit. But please keep entering them. I'm sure I probably hit everything at way too high a level. So, you know, grill me by all means. Thanks, Brandon. So uh, ju jumping back here, as, as Brandon mentioned, we are going to jump into a demo. But right before we do, I wanted to show you what we're going to be demoing. Um, RightScale and Google are releasing a social gaming edition. Um, RightScale has had a social gaming edition out there for a while. However, we have some, some special pricing that's going to be associated with this, and we'll get to that uh, just after the demo. Um, however, this is the architecture that we're, we're looking at pushing out for these customers. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty standard three-tier architect architecture, um, load balancing application servers, and then databasing on the back end. Um, in this particular instance, we're looking at era, we're looking at using Couchbase as the technology. It's something that we've seen other gaming companies use. Um, however, you could really use any database technology, a MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, um, really any kind of database technology. We have templates for many different types. So with that, uh, give me one second, and I'm going to flip into the demo. Okay, so here's the RightScale dashboard. Um, so we've logged into the uh, one of our RightScale Google accounts, and what we're looking at here is a, a version of the architecture that we just looked at. So you see here we have a couple of load balancers. We have caching servers. This is the way that a, a couple of our very large gaming companies uh, like to do architecture uh, for games. A couple of caching servers. Uh, uh, down here, a scalable array of PHP application servers and then a, a replicated MySQL database. So you have the ability to set all of this up with RightScale stock templates. As you can see here, these, these are you know, imported directly from RightScale. Um, any of these can be modified, tweaked, changed. If you want to use uh, JBoss or Tomcat or something, if it's a Java game, uh, all of those templates are available in our multi-cloud marketplace. Um, and, and all of them work on the Google Cloud platform. Uh, you see here we've got, uh, this is distributed across a, a number of different zones within the Google Cloud. So as Brandon mentioned, the, uh, the data transfer between these zones is cost-free and encrypted. Um, for those of you who I know that we had a few that are using other cloud providers, you may uh, recognize that, that is not something that a lot of cloud providers offer. Um, we, we found that to be a very valuable thing, particularly in the database space and for high availability. So if you are you know, wanting to be able to run a high availability database, uh, having the ability to replicate master to slave in the same region as well as out to a different data center in a completely different physical location uh, can give you a lot more peace of mind and a lot more nines um, from an uptime perspective. So it's a, uh, it's a way to do risk mitigation. Uh, and and right scale from a, from a mechanical standpoint, to be able to set up another slave database 
I could open up this database right here, clone it and relaunch it and just change the zone that it's being launched in. And it would come up, it would load the most current version of the database. It would download, uh, in it would begin doing replication in real time. It would be added to any servers that needed to do writes, excuse me, reads from it. Um, so any application servers or caching servers that wanted to grab data out of it, uh, all of that happens automatically. So I wanted to open up uh, one of these servers and show you a little bit about how the automation works. So if we open up a load balancer here, um, the first screen you come to, a little bit of information about the server itself. Um, you know, Ryan Geyer, one of our sales engineers, launched it. It's based on a CentOS 6.3 64-bit image. Um, we're running this on an N1 standard 1D, which is the sort of medium instance size at Google. Uh, and then the different groups, the security groups that it has access to. So, you know, we need to be able to SSH into this. It's a member of a load balancing tier, so they, we can add that to the application tier and so on. Uh, and then the data center that it's running in. If we jump to the monitoring tab here, you'll see that this is where that monitoring data comes in and turns into monitoring graphs. So we have, uh, we have a couple that are up here sort of pre-programmed. So we've got the Apache uh, scoreboard, we've got CPU overview, but you see up here, we have a whole lot of different metrics that we can monitor. So anything from Apache uh, performance to CPU, to disk space, to memory, um, and then up into software processes, so like HA proxy, which is the software load balancer running in here, uh, or collect D, which is the monitoring daemon running in here. Uh, all of these can be uh, used to drive automation and we use a open source monitoring tool, CollectD, as I mentioned, to do this. So you actually can write custom plugins, and we've seen customers build some very interesting, uh, very interesting automated processes. Uh, a good example is one of our larger social gaming customers um, streams in data around the revenue that the game is generating from in-game purchases and virtual goods. And if their forecasted revenue deviates from their actual revenue by a certain amount, uh, an email goes to the sysadmins letting them know that there may be a performance degradation going on in the game or there may be a problem with the game. So there are a lot of things that you can do with this that make it very uh, very powerful and, and very good for managing, especially a large-scale a large scale game. If I jump to the alerts tab here, this is where the, uh, the other end of the automation happens. So we bring that same monitoring data in here and we perform these if-then statements on it. So let's take, uh, this is a fairly basic one, Apache not running. So if Apache uh, count processes is less than one for five minutes, then we escalate to critical. So we, uh, what we're doing there is we're simply saying if, if nobody is on here and it's not connecting and we're not getting any connections, we're going to escalate this to a critical action. In this case, I believe it just sends an email and, and we can dig into that um, by looking at the escalation here. Some of the other options that you have uh, inside of RightScale for, uh, for automation beyond just sending an email, as I mentioned, that's what this, this alert does, or you can reboot or relaunch the server. You can run a script. So if you want to try to restart Apache or reload Apache, you can do that. Or in a caching server case, you can run a script that clears the cache. Uh, or down here, we have the scale up and scale down. So vote to grow and vote to shrink. So RightScale chooses to use what we call a voting mechanism for our, uh, for our scalability. Uh, the reason we do that is that if one server has a problem or if uh, an application has a, a problem and gets stuck in a loop and the CPU spikes, it doesn't scale your application out of control. Um, instead, what it does is it says across all of the different servers of this type, I want a majority to reach consensus before I take an action. Uh, and then if, we, uh, if, I, if I jump back out to our main screen here, I'm going to show you in our arrays how that actually happens. So if we open up that deployment again, and we open up the array down here, here's how the auto scaling actually occurs. So you see this is associated with that same deployment. It's alert based, which is the alerts we were just looking at. Um, we're going to launch a new PHP server, the images and all the, the base stuff that's associated with it. And then down here is the, the real meat and potatoes. So we run a minimum count of two at all times. Uh, that's for high availability. So if one goes down or has a problem, there's always another one there to take its place. So sort of standard HA, no single point of failure. And in this case, we've actually capped it because it's a demo application. We don't want 
if something were to happen for it to scale up and for us to incur a whole bunch of cost. Uh, we weight the scalability. So in this case, uh, we've weighted it mostly in the US. Um, you can weight it around the world in any of the different regions that Google has available. So you can also set this as all in one or across all of them evenly. Um, or you can set this to neutral and it will just scale one by one by one by one. Down here, uh, the decision threshold. So what the decision threshold is, is when I mentioned the, the voting mechanism, we want 51% of the servers to reach consensus or a majority vote before an action is taken. So you can tweak this as needed for your application. Uh, down here, you can schedule your scaling. So if you know that you're going to have a, a promo going on or you're going to have a, a, a big influx of users to do a marketing campaign, um, you can actually set schedule scaling to spin up at 7.30 in the morning on a, on a Tuesday so that when users start to log in at 8, there is plenty of capacity for them and you don't even have to deal with scaling up. Um, you see here, resize up and down by different amounts. So we find in the social gaming world that, that these numbers can vary a bit, um, especially in the early days when you're launching a game and going through your growth phase. Uh, a, a lot of times you want to be able to over provision so that you don't have any downtime or any sort of an issue with performance. Um, and then resize down by a smaller amount. So you can spin up five and then go down by one until you hit just the right amount of, of compute power. Uh, then the calm time here is how long right scale waits between the time that the server launches and the time that it checks to see if it's resolved the, uh, the scalability. So with that, I'm actually going to jump back into the, the PowerPoint here, and we're going to talk about the pricing promotion that we have going on. Um, if anyone would like to get a more thorough demo, please you know, put it in the questions area. Please send us a note, uh, and, and we'll, uh, we'll be happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with you guys. Uh, so one second here while I flip back over. So, what we've done is we've released a social gaming edition with, uh, with Google. Um, we've waived the upfront fee for the rest of this year. So if you sign up this year, you, you basically save $10,000 upfront and you get access to our onboarding service that is, you know, specifically tailored for the gaming environments. Um, and it's, you know, delivered by the team that has helped build the, you know, Call of Duty infrastructure in Farmville and Cityville and, uh, and a variety of other games. Uh, we're going to give you three free passes to RightScale Jumpstart training. That's a three-day training course that is basically a zero-to-cloud training course. Um, if you know very little about uh, very little about the cloud in general, very little about RightScale, you're new to it. Um, in three days, you'll be able to build basically the architecture we were just looking at. Uh, in fact, the third day you spend building that architecture. So um, it's a it's a pretty great uh, pretty great program. And then you also get access to the gaming reference architecture, which we just talked about. And our team will help you build that out uh, and understand all the quirks and nuances of it to make sure that it's all tweaked and tuned perfectly for your game. Uh, right now, we're also offering a, a, a special promo around right scale usage. Um, so the right scale costs are, are twofold on a monthly basis. Typically, they are a monthly subscription as well as a usage component, similar to uh, any cloud platform like Google Compute. Uh, however, we're waiving that usage aspect uh, as long as you are using Google Compute with RightScale. So it's a flat rate with RightScale, $3,500 a month for access to the platform. You get two RightScale accounts, so you can carve out dev, test, QA, and staging into its own environment and invite all of your different developers and users and have production in a separate account. Um, that can be for, you know, for budgeting and cost reasons, cost tracking reasons, or for access control and security reasons. Uh, you can just carve those out. And then you also get, uh, you get two Google Cloud projects for compute um, that are associated with both of those accounts, uh, and then 10 permissioned users. Uh, as I mentioned, we waive the usage fees. You get uh, the complete functionality that RightScale has to offer, so enterprise reporting, uh, infrastructure auditing to see what, uh, you know, what IPs have access to what, what ports are open, and so on. All of that is included. Uh, gold 24-7 phone support. So we have fo uh, follow the sun support for both RightScale and Google. You'll be able to call us up and we'll be able to answer your question in, in under an hour. Uh, and, then, and then also single billing capabilities. So you're actually going to be purchasing the Google, Google compute costs through RightScale uh, and you're going to be able to 
a single bill, even other ISV technologies. So if you wanted to layer on a, a riverbed or something for advanced traffic management, you could do that. Uh, or if you wanted to say use the, the, the enterprise version of PHP from Zend, um, we also have those templates in our library and we can, uh, similar to the App Store with Apple, you're able to grab those technologies, load them into your environment and Red Seal simply uh, adds them at the bottom of your bill. So uh, with that, Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for joining the webinar. Um, RightScale has a sorry the slide's not advancing. There we go. Um, RightScale has a conference coming up next week. RightScale computes in San Francisco. Uh, tickets are on sale now. It should be a great show. We've had a, a few of these in the past. I'm, I'm, I hope some of you have attended them. Um, we have uh, Google will be there sponsoring as well. They'll be speaking on a panel and giving a couple of a uh, couple of different talks. Uh, and then also, we're going to be working with Google on the go on the going Google road shows. So for those of you who are geographically dispersed from the Bay Area, uh, we will be in, uh, I, or actually I will be in San Francisco tomorrow and Washington, D.C. the next day, then Indianapolis next week, and, and all over the country. So um, look it up, come find us, email us at gonegoogleroadshow at rightscale.com, and we'll be happy to find a city that's close by for you, and we can meet up in person. Uh, but with that, let's uh, let's jump into some questions here. Um, let me uh, let me start that off. So we had one that came in before uh, before the webinar started, and let's uh, let's start with that one. So, what are the best ways to mount <laughs> a, a fail whale page for a variety of issues, servers, database, DNS, etc.? So, alluding to alluding to what Twitter does when uh, when Twitter goes down. So, RightScale has the ability to do that. Um, when I showed the automation systems there, you can have one of those uh, run a script. So let's say you're receiving a, a not a number response from your database and uh, for, for the CPU, or it's not responding and your website is down effectively. That information can be sent to RightScale. We check the monitoring data every few seconds. So if that happens for more than a few seconds, we can automatically run a script that will put up a splash page and let, let users know that you're working on it. It can let users know that they can go to another URL for updates. Uh, really up to you what you want to put on the splash page, but it's certainly something that we can, that we can do for you. Um, here's, a, here's another one, and, and Brandon, this one's for, for probably both for you and I. Um, we use Tableau to do some BI analytics on our SQL database. How could it be used in case we migrate to a NoSQL tool or which BI options exist for this kind of, or for these kinds of databases. So sure. I, I personally ahead. am not, oh, go ahead, Brandon. No, 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 you start there and then I'll, I'll follow up. So I, I personally don't know all the different technologies that Tableau supports. Uh, I know that, that BigQuery, the tool that Google has for loading that data into and being able to take it apart, BigQuery is a, is a great technology. Um, and you could use a Tableau or a ClickView or something on the front end to look at that data. Um, it's likely that a company like Tableau will be adding support for NoSQL databases. Um, however, at this point, Brandon, I'll, I'll let you uh, talk a little bit about it if you know more about Tableau. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm fairly confident that Tableau offers uh, support for both. Um, I think probably this is maybe a little bit more nuanced answer than maybe you asked, but I think the initial place we're seeing a lot of most customers start is, is with a SQL database. And that doesn't mean that the SQL databases don't go uh, or go away. They may continue to use them. And there's a lot of reasons uh, that that's a good fit. But they, uh, a lot of clients are also then keeping more and more data in NoSQL. So a lot of our customers live in both data worlds. Um, and there's a couple options on this. Certainly Tableau can help you from a visualization of a database. Um, or maybe if you want to put a few together. But where the, uh, the actual visualization struggles is when you start putting a massive amount of data. So if you decide you want to cram a few terabytes of data uh, and then you want to add another couple terabytes of data and you want to understand how these two are correlated, um, that's where BigQuery would be leveraged. So the net of it is you can leverage uh, SQL uh, or NoSQL on the cloud platform, whether that's RightScale has got a bunch of uh, SQL options. I believe they also have a number of NoSQL options that you can can leverage. Uh, and we've had, you know, I said MapR, but you know, Mongo's on as well, which is another NoSQL uh, team. So there's a, for the nuanced answer is it kind of depends on what you want to accomplish, but you can really do it all on the platform 
and then use typically what we're seeing is that the tableaus, the volumes, the click views are used to really visualize that, um, but they aren't the primary place to do really large uh, data uh, analytics. So that's usually where people are seeing people use BigQuery. That's a long great, answer. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, thanks, Brandon. That was great. Um, so let, let me take one here, and then I've got another one to, uh, to toss to you, Brandon. Um, do you all have uh, templates for MySQL cluster? Um, so we do. Uh, we actually have a lot of experience there, and, and one of the things that we've we've honestly struggled with in the past is things like a master master configuration of MySQL. Um, though I, I uh, can't necessarily speak to the technical abilities uh, of MySQL master in a master master configuration uh, on GCE, given the uh, consistency and the uh, very high performing network. Uh, it may be possible to run a master master configuration. I know that with uh, other cloud providers in the past, we've struggled a lot with that, particularly around the consistency and the performance. Uh, but it is something that we we certainly can do. Um, and as for MySQL cluster, it, I mean, I know that there's a lot of different versions of that. We have templates for several different types of MySQL. Um, and again, these templates are they're not necessarily hard and fast rules. You can you can go in and take them apart and put them back together. So they are, we give them to you as is, and if you need to tweak a version or you need to add something to it, uh, very easy to do. All the scripts are sort of at your disposal to be able to modify. Um, and, and we do have some templates for that and some experience there. We actually, I believe, have a white paper about MySQL cluster as well, if you'd like to check that out on the Red Scale website. So Brandon, here's one for you. Um, do you have something similar to Cloudera's Impala uh, to provide SQL access to big data? Um, yeah, actually, so if you actually look at, and, I, and I'm, I'm guilty of the fact we don't actually look at other people's technology in any in real depth um, or kind of ask not to, mostly because we're just focused on what we want to create. But um, Cloudera's uh, Impala, uh, if you look at it, I believe that they, that, that was probably based off of Dremel, the white paper that was released about five years ago, four, five, four years ago now, and is Dremel is the foundation for um, for BigQuery. So yes, actually that's kind of what BigQuery is. It's the notion of giving uh, at scale uh, a SQL like so you can write SQL queries against big uh, events, the terabytes or petabytes of data in cloud storage through BigQuery, and you can run it there. So if you're looking at uh, Impala, I would have, I suggest you play a bit with BigQuery. It's open. Go have some fun. Um, certainly, if I didn't answer your question in, in more depth, let me know. Uh, we do work very closely with uh, a lot of the companies like uh, uh, Cloudera with uh, MongoDB. So there's also options. There may be something nuanced that you're looking for that I missed. Uh, so you know, don't uh, don't hesitate to let me know if we want to go in more depth. We certainly can. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so we do have uh, we have one more, and it's kind of a long question. So bear with me as I read it. Uh, but it's a very good question. Uh, with standards such as OpenStack and Cloud Foundry gaining some traction, most cloud vendors are pushing their customers to a platform as a service model. Google seems to be going the other direction, starting with its App Engine offering, which was a pass offering to infrastructure as a service to Google Compute. Uh, why? This seems to be counter to the notion that you'll need more admin staff to manage your applications in infrastructure as a service. So Brandon, I'll, I'll let you take this. Uh, I, I, have one, uh, I have one comment that I want to open with there, and that's that RightScale sees this uh, merging of platform as a service and infrastructure as a service going on um, in the market right now. Uh, right, right scale itself is really a platform to build platform as a service. So if you wanted to build a, uh, a service that your developers or if you're a, even a pharma company or something in a totally different space than gaming, you can create a platform where people that have minimal systems knowledge can go in and spin up environments and have easy access to IT without necessarily having the, the constraints that some platform as a service offerings have. Um, App Engine is a terrific offering, and, and I'll let Brandon address it, um, for running a, a, something that's in Python or something that's in Java. However, if you're running a Ruby on Rails app, it doesn't necessarily fit that mold. 
So we find that it's really a marriage between the two where platform as a service allows you to run games or applications that are uh, need less intervention and are a little bit more standardized. And then all of the ancillary services, the cron jobs, the video processing, all of that can happen in an infrastructure as a service offering. So Brandon, do you want to do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Um, only a little bit because I think your view, it's right still, your view is very similar to ours. Um, but why? Um, some of this is I'm just going to be honest. I wasn't with Google and I was not on the team that made the decision as to exactly how this is. So this is more just you know kind of my view uh, on the in, on the industry. Um, I think some of it, to be blunt, is that Google's good at learning from what the what the market says and what the facts say. And what uh, the facts say is that platform as a service um, has uh, a lot of potential, but it's a niche space. There's um, a lot of people that either have come from legacy that need to have some different uh, configurations of the database middleware uh, network layers in order to deliver the kind of um, applications they would expect. So it's not as simple as up and move. Um, and so Google wanted, to, wanted the opportunity, we wanted to be able to address the, the wider market. So uh, obviously one of those is giving a seamless kind of um, space in which you can go everywhere from an infrastructure service really to a platform service. Um, we think it's probably validating our long-term view. So you'll find, I think, App Engine is probably, we are looking uh, probably ahead of the market a bit as far as where we're going. And certainly the messaging is very consistent with what we're hearing from Cloud Foundry, Great Place, OpenStack, same view. Um, but the net of it is uh, we think that the market's going to need both. And we've, we've found that specifically one of our great strengths that we talked about is, is uh, back-end data. Um, a lot of that back-end data comes through a lot of different sources, not just a platform as a service. So fundamentally, for Google to bring the most value to our clients, um, we need to be able to deal with all the data that they have that they want to process. And that will come through infrastructure service, kind of from platform as a service, it will even come in the next layer up of a, a business process of a service, or you choose your AAS version that we're going to see in the marketplace. But uh, the net is we think the data is something that we, as a core company to Google, and we felt like we should probably be addressing the whole market in order to really uh, help our clients. So, Thanks, hope Brandon. that helps. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Um, so here, here we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody again for uh, for joining. Um, hope it was informative for everyone. If anyone would like to follow up with us, um, please go to rightscale.com slash Google. You'll find all the information about the pricing promos that we have going on there, uh, and you'll be able to contact us directly. Uh, and please reach out. We look forward to look forward to speaking with you. Thanks again.